My favorite of Paul's letters is this one that we just read today to the Galatians. Not because when I was growing up and no one knew how to say my last name correctly, it always got butchered to Galatia. No, that's actually a reason to not like this letter. I like the letter to Galatians because it is angry Paul. Paul is not happy with the Galatian people. He opens the letter after the the pleasantries that you have to do where you say who you are and who the people are, and he does his grace and peace to you through our Lord Jesus Christ. He opens the very first thing he says. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Isn't that a great opening line? You heathens, is the short version of what he said. So he's writing this thing to a church. Usually, he saves that bit for like the middle of the letter. He's, you know, in the other ones, he starts out with like, oh, you guys are doing so great. I give thanks to you, to God for you all the time. You're just wonderful. You just got a couple things you need to do better on. Nope, not in Galatians. You guys are wrong. And it gets better. Because after a little while, he says, Oh, you foolish Galatians, who has witched you? And then a bit later, there's a little infamous part in Galatians 5.12 that you can just go ahead and look up on your own because we don't... Just know that it's rather infamous. Galatians 5.12, you know, just, just, just remember that one. So you see, the church in Galatia is struggling with the very same issue that we talked about last week. Do you have to be Jewish to be Christian? Now, after reading in Acts chapter 15, we kind of thought that was settled. The leaders of the church met together, they wrote a letter, they sent the letter out, and that should have just been that. But apparently the church in Galatia didn't get the memo because this is what Paul's letter is entirely about. He's writing even with the same fervor that he used to use to persecute the church, only now he's using it to further the message of Christ. So he writes this letter to the church in Galatia. But by the way, how many of you know where Galatia is? Any idea? A couple of you maybe? So it's a, a region in central Turkey that was originally settled by Spanish Celts, who are called Gauls, which is why it's called Galatia. So it's the people from Gaul, which is now Spain, who went all the way over to Turkey and settled there until it got taken over by the Greeks and then the Romans. And by by about the first century BC, they were pretty well Roman, but they still spoke a variation on the Celtic language that they spoke when they got there. Um, So you can guess that in a place that was in Turkey that was very Greek-looking, that was settled by people from Spain, you probably would have a Jewish minority in this town. And if you had to be a Jew before you were a Christian, you could see why this would cause problems in a church in this kind of region. Because the Gentiles that would be coming to Christ would probably not want to be a Jew first. They would just want to be a Christian especially if they had heard about the letter that they sent out of Acts chapter 15 that said all you got to do is watch what you eat and don't sleep around, which really was kind of the gist of the letter that they sent. So Paul, when he heard about this, he writes this angry letter to combat what he thought was their complete and utter stupidity. So here Paul goes, presenting his argument over why it is perfectly acceptable to be a Gentile Christian. He first opens by saying, I preach to you a gospel that is quite different from the not at all a gospel that y'all are living by. It's not a gospel I made up. It's a gospel that I got straight from Jesus, the one you claim to be following. And so he starts telling his story. He starts talking about how he persecuted the church how he was extremely jealous or zealous in his Judaism, 
But God reached out to him and told him to preach to the Gentiles, which he did without waiting and checking and seeing if it was okay. He just went and preached to the Gentiles. And then when he went to pay his respects to Peter and James, it, everybody said, oh yeah, you're doing great. Carry on what you're doing. Then he recounts his experience at the council in Jerusalem that we talked about last week. And then he talks about this incident that happened when he came to the town of Antioch. And he was in Antioch. And Peter was in Antioch, and Peter started to act a little bit more Jewish than Christian. And he started only hanging out with the people who were Jewish. And he started eating and behaving like the people who were Jewish. This is Peter, by the way. Peter, the one who really should know better. Peter, the one who had a vision and was sent to a Roman centurion to preach the gospel to him. Peter, who stood up in the council in Jerusalem that we talked about last week and said... I had this vision. I went to preach to some Gentiles. They received the Holy Spirit. They must be Christian. Because if you receive the Holy Spirit, it's probably a pretty good bet that someone is a Christian. That's just how that works. So, so Paul sees Peter acting this way. Paul sees Peter drawing his friends into this. And he goes right up to Peter, gets right in his face, and says, Dude. And actually... The way he phrases this is beautiful. He says, and I'm I'm, going to say it the way the Bible records it, and then I'm going to say it the way he probably said it. We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. What he's really saying is, dude, Peter, the people you're treating like sinners are better Christians than you. Shape up. You're an apostle. Do better. It's, he, it's, I mean, it's, it's just this dig, and he twists the knife even. Because he's telling Peter. You remember Peter. Peter, who always wanted to be the one that was most passionately following Jesus. Peter, the one who first preached to Gentiles and, thought not, and nobody thought it was a big deal. Peter, who stood up on the day of Pentecost and gave this great sermon that converted 3,000 people to the church. And Peter's the one who is wrong. Because it's not about what we do that saves us. It's not about what we do that makes us Christian. It's about what Jesus has already done. And that's the whole point that Paul is trying to make here. Because the more that people argued over, do you have to be Jewish before you become a Christian, it really came down to, how much are we going to stomp on what Christ did? Because if we honestly are saying, Jesus died for me and rose again that I might live, And then we try to add anything to that. And we add things like, but you have to do this first. But you have to do this first. There's some Lutheran writers who I I almost get in fights with because they sometimes try to make it almost say, Jesus died for you so that you don't have to do anything except to be baptized. I'm like, no, you can't go there. Because if Jesus died for us so that we are no longer responsible for our own salvation, but he is, we can't add a but. We can't add a but you have to be baptized. We can't add a but you have to be circumcised like the people in Galatia were trying to do. There is no but. Jesus died for you. Done. This was the thing that kicked off Luther's realization that there are no buts after Jesus' death and resurrection. Because if we think we can earn our salvation in any other way than trusting in God for to have all trusting in God to have already done it for us, we're only going to make things worse. Because our salvation, thanks to Jesus, is no longer about us. Where before, you had to follow the law. 
And as we've been noticing in adult Sunday school, it's not enough to follow the law a little bit. You have to follow the whole law, all 619 or 620, however, depending on your count, of these laws, which are eventually you're going to break one. Especially when Jesus up the ante and says, it's not enough to just break the law in action. Breaking the law in your mind and in your thoughts is just as bad. So what Jesus did on the cross is to say, no, I'm going to do this for them. I am going to be the one who follows the law so that they don't have to. And then in his death and resurrection, he sealed that deal. And then now all of us have come to faith in Christ, not because we are so good and great and wonderful, but because Jesus is good and great and wonderful. Now, I don't know about you, but that makes me feel a lot better. Because I know that it isn't up to me anymore. I don't have to be perfect. Because Jesus was already perfect for my sake. I don't have to always get everything right because Jesus got everything right for me. As we trust in him and as we walk in with him, yes, we will stumble. Yes, we will still fall into sin, but we know that when we turn back to Jesus, he forgives us. We know that when we turn back to Jesus, that sin is not a big deal because Jesus already defeated sin for us. And I think this is why Paul gets so annoyed with this letter because these people are lessening what Christ did by trying to add requirements to it. They're taking the good news of Christ is risen Death is beaten and God wins. And they're turning that message into, yes, all that is true, but you still have to do this, 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 and this, and this, and this. And the list of this is always gets longer. Because if there were thises and things and buts that we had to do, why did Jesus fulfill the law? Why would Jesus fulfill the law and save us because we can't save ourselves if we could save ourselves? We wouldn't need Christ if we could do it on our own. But instead, God opened up salvation to all people, Jew or Gentile, lawkeeper or lawbreaker, because of Christ. And you'd think that we would have gotten it right by now. But we haven't. We still add things that people think they have to do to be Christian. Uh, for instance, I get told that I'm a terrible pastor all the time because I refuse to get legalistic about things. I've had a, I have had another Christian tell me that I was a terrible pastor because, and I, I want to say this very carefully, I said that the Christian church needs to reevaluate how we interact with people who have had abortions and say that we should be less hateful toward them and more loving toward them. And for that, I was told that I was a terrible pastor and shouldn't be in charge of churches. It's kind of amazing, right? So it's odd to me that people like, if you don't check these boxes off, that you shouldn't be a Christian. And everybody's got a different set of boxes, of course, but if we have boxes like that, we're just adding a new law. We are, as Paul puts it, we're rebuilding what Christ destroyed. Because if righteousness could be gained through the law, he says... Christ died for nothing. Because we're not called to follow a set of rules. We're called to follow the person, Jesus. The one who came to this earth 
taught and healed, went to a cross and rose again. We are justified before God, not because of the things we do and don't do, but because of the things Christ did. No buts. Christ's work does it all. And so because of the grace that God shows us through Christ's work, we don't have to worry about following the law of Moses. We don't have to worry about following these laws for Christians that people consistently come up with. But instead, if we follow Christ and his example, not because of an obligation, but because of thankfulness for what he did for us, that shows that we are saved. Because when we are following Christ, the one who saved us, the things that we will do are the things that he did. We will preach good news to the poor. We will proclaim freedom for the captive, recovery of sight to the blind, release for the oppressed, and tell everyone that this is the year of our Lord. Because that's what he did. Because all we do as Christians is to seek to emulate the one who is perfect and trust that when we're not perfect, that when we turn back to him, we will be forgiven. Because God wants us to be saved. He wants all people to be saved. And when we look only to Jesus for our salvation, that's when it happens. <laughs>